Hello and good morning. My name is Mark Hamzat Arabogbo. I am chairman of Energy and Natural Resources with the FENG, the Financial Executives Networking Group. The FENG Financial Executives Networking Group is the largest uh, executive finance organization in the world. We have approximately 40,000 members. It is invitation only. Every single member is personally vetted by uh, Matt Budd, who is the CEO and founder of the FANG. If you're interested in uh, joining, joining or becoming a member, please reach out to myself or one of the other FANG members. And we will begin our program, the uh, State of Energy and Capital Markets. We'll be starting with our uh, first speaker, Mr. Justin. Hoffman, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Justin Hoffman. Um, as Mark mentioned, I'm a partner, a corporate partner at Winston and Strawn, um, where I practiced um, energy law and transactional work in Houston um, for almost 10 years and about 20 years of um, corporate practice in general focusing on the capital markets in particular. Um, so uh, today, briefly, I just wanted to give um, an overview of, um, you know, kind of what I'm seeing and hearing out there. I've been to a couple conferences um, uh, very recently um, where I got to hear a, a good cross-section of a lot of perspectives about these markets. So um, try to kind of synthesize that in just a few minutes here. I'm going to share my screen. Um, where I prepared a few slides. Um, folks see that, hopefully. Yes, sir. All right, great. So, um, you know, I think just going through kind of overview there, um, talking about the trends we're seeing, you know, in energy space, particularly, um, there's a real focus on capital discipline and return um, of capital to shareholders, which has been good, you know, for um, equity values and public equity markets um, in terms of the sector, which has rebounded from, you know, what was a terrible year, um, you know, during the height of the pandemic. And obviously, um, you know, fundamentals remain strong. I think from what I hear, um, you know, there's obviously going to be significant interest in projects that involve export of gas to Europe, given um, what's going on there and uncertainty around when the war will end. And, you know, I think wanting to have some, um, you know, freedom in the near future from, um, you know, R Russian gas supplies in particular. Um, but um, unfortunately, that, you know, all of that doesn't really translate into a lot of additional sort of capital raising activity for new issues. So, um, you know, uh, that's generally been down. Um, and, you know, m most um, press that you read, it, you know, sort of talks about capital discipline, uh, cost cutting. And, um, you know, the um, services companies certainly have a lot of leverage right now, but I think, um, you know, the larger uh, upstream producers have gotten um, significantly more efficient in the last, um, you know, since the last downturn. So they're sort of the public line that I kept hearing was that, um, you know, many companies can be profitable um, and continue to return free cash flow to, to stakeholders, even, um, you know, at significantly lower commodity prices than what we have now and what we see projected. So, you know, that's sort of a good thing for, um, you know, existing stakeholders, but, um, you know, I think consolidation and, um, you know, continued um, sort of tepid um, you know, capital markets activity is probably um, going to be the order of the day here. So, I got a few, just a few slides on um, some of the data synthesized from some public sources here. Um, you can just see, um, you know, energy equity offerings are way down um, the last several years, even though there's been, you know, a, a spike in the WTI uh, crude price there on the first um, chart. And then, you know, just more of the same sort of in the equity and the debt um, issuances volumes there on the bottom. Um, and then, you know, in the debt markets in particular, which is something that I spend a lot of my time on in terms of the high yield debt markets um, has been continually, you know, challenging um, and just has not seen, you know, the significant um, levels of issuances that 
were prevalent, um, you know, for many years, especially during the boom time. So um, obviously a product of, um, you know, inflationary concerns, um, what the stockholders want to see, and then um, rising interest rates, you know, making these credits, um, you know, priced out of the market because of the, you know, other pricing headwinds that was already baked in to, um, you know, some of the companies given where they, they sit. So, um, you know, that I would say is sort of an overview of, you know, what we see in capital markets, um, you know, in debt capital markets on sort of the private markets, um, private equity, um, you know, again, uh, probably somewhat slightly more negative um, in some ways, um, but, you know, coming off of a, a significant, you know, bull run of many years of, of growth in the industry writ large. So, you know, last year, obviously, toward the middle of the year, um, saw kind of a, a, a significant slowdown that I think people are predicting, you know, will continue in sort of overall fundraising. Um, so, you know, we got the quote there from S&P that's very recent, um, you know, that, that managers are pessimistic. Um, and then, you know, in the oil patch in particular, I think, um, you know, the stock stocks of these companies has have performed quite well, but they're continue, you know, I think if you kind of look at historical uh, multiples, they're um, considerably undervalued. So that is obviously driving the share repurchase behavior, and it makes it difficult for companies to, um, you know, to structure mergers using stock consideration when, um, you know, that stock is, is is not valued where you know one side wants it to be. Complicates the exit picture um, in terms of transactions through the public markets and IPOs and such. So, um, you know, I think at the bottom there, I suggest this. I mean, there's two reasons I think we're going to see um, some changes in the, um, you know, models of some of the private equity firms in terms of the horizon for the exit. I mean, one big, bigger, you know, overall macro reason is obviously the um, continuing movement of funds, investments into um, renewables and longer term, um, you know, projects on energy transition that are going to take a lot longer to become profitable, even with, you know, tax credits and such. So I think, um, and and obviously, you know, kind of how returns are going to be measured on products that have ESG goals attached to them is going to be a little bit different than, you know, traditional, um, you know, financial returns. And those methodologies are still being worked out in real time through, you know, regulations, other accounting um, forms and such. So, you know, that's going to be just an interesting thing to keep an eye on, I'd say. Um, and just a few more slides kind of concluding. Um, I want to keep us on track um, here. You know, this is just showing there really have not been as many or any significant sort of entries into, um, you know, in, into the, the traditional oil and gas space, um, there's been more exits and, you know, deal volume um, generally is down, um, you know, bankruptcies are down too, which is a good thing. Um, it, it, but that is obviously another another type of deal. Um, so, you know, there's just kind of an interesting um, sort of standstill in some ways that's going on now. And then finally, um, just again, this is just showing the, um, the low public multiples, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, clearly, also helping to put the brakes on um, what could have been a, a potential for an exit for some of the companies that are locked in. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing to say about private equity that you do see is sort of the aggregator model, um, you know, companies putting together investment teams that are not sort of tethered to the fund, but, you know, are utilizing the fund infrastructure for uh, uh, purposes of, you know, the the leveraging all the resources and acumen, industry knowledge. Um, and obviously, you know, I think um, this consolidation, you know, in some ways um, is tough on management teams because there will be less, you know, asset packages available for, you know, discrete management teams when you see the aggregation. So um, it's certainly going to sharpen, you, you know, competition and focus, um, it, 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 you know, for the best opportunities for everybody, um, you know, in, in the system. Anyway, um, but I, I do think, you know, there's a lot of optimism out there and, you know, we certainly, you know, at, at Winston are seeing, you know, people try to put deals together around these types of issues, LNG, you know, water infrastructure, you know, midstream infrastructure, you know, joint ventures and then smaller deals, um, you know, smaller discrete packages of, of assets um, away from some of these more consolidated positions. So I think there'll still be 
plenty of other types of deal activities, um, you know, away from some of what had been the traditional, um, you know, things that, that people were doing and, and, you know, potentially new things will develop that hopefully will, you know, absorb some of that volume as, as things stabilize. Anyway, thanks everyone for the time. I appreciate it, Mark. Excellent. Thanks a lot. And if you just share your information in the chat and we'll move on to uh, our, our next panelist, and that will be Alex uh, Rosenfeld with Climate Impact Capital. Thank you. And if you can please uh, go into uh, slideshow mode as well. Um, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on the talk tonight and um, or today. And uh, I think this follows well to what Justin was saying about what's going, to, what's happening in the energy markets, uh, climate impact capital. We focus on, on venture capital and energy is particular to the energy transition and, and climate change. So uh, as a firm, we're not marketing any anything to anyone. We're not selling anything, so see the disclaimer. Uh, my, my background is in corporate uh, angel and venture capital. I did that for close to 20 years before founding Climate Impact Capital um, seven years ago. Uh, we focus on identifying better ways to accelerate uh, capital formation and the uh, deployment of technology in the energy space, uh, which covers for us uh, oil, oil and gas, power and, and downstream. And our, our unique elements from our financial packaging side a little bit is what Justin was also saying is that uh, we really don't believe in kind of blind pool efforts for investing. We look and do due diligence and package investments uh, together, particularly around forming large new businesses. So we lightly lay the foundations for new businesses through integration of uh, early stage startups. So what, what do we kind of see kind of as the long-term uh, potential in this market and why are we excited about it? Well, if you look on, on the right-hand side uh, that the uh, predictions around uh, long-term and even kind of medium-term global CO2 are um, not that great if we don't follow any climate policies and even current policies are not getting us to where we want to go uh, generally in the sub, you know, two degree uh, uh, Celsius change in, in uh, climate uh, mean temperature. And so we see, as we've seen most recently in the IRA, the Infrastructure Act, uh, what's going on in Europe in their Green New Deal equivalent that they've had now for a number of years, that there's an ongoing very strong uh, government interest in subsidizing and bringing in new technologies around energy. And so it makes that a good opportunity for that. And then at the same time, we're also seeing the physical impacts of climate change already in the very high number of massive uh, weather and climate uh, related events, whether it's uh, multiple freezes in Texas, floods in California, same thing in Asia and Europe. Uh, it creates a lot of stress on infrastructure. And when those that infrastructure goes down, there's opportunities to invest in it. So when you're talking about on the order of $3 trillion that needs to get invested by the end of this decade. And then another $2 trillion over the next couple of decades. It's really clear that there's multiples of uh, investment capital needed on the order of uh, you know, six to seven times more than we're investing right now. So it aims to really provide a good opportunity for capital to flow in and take advantage of that. And so, let me kind of jump jump into why kind of we kind of a believer in technology. So I, I come from uh, MIT, and those who haven't uh, uh, kind of gone to some of the MIT uh, technology aspects of climate change, they provide this tool, public tool called Climate Interactive um, and Roads Modeling. And so when you look at that, is they kind of provide a kind of a techno-economic view of how do you how can you get to kind of a better world, and kind of where would you invest into if, you, if that's the driver. So their, their models right now show about a three and a half degree increase with business as usual, um, with no you know, major changes from the status quo. But when you start looking at the use cases for the model and you kind of begin seeing what's going on actually right now with, if you look here in the, in the center, is you know, there's incentive, incentive 
coming in for electrification through you know the charger charging incentives in Inflation Reduction Act, electrification through of, of course uh, more subsidies and interest for building uh, restructuring building building electrification, energy efficiency. All of these things are being already fairly incentivized. Um, on the right hand side, you can see carbon removal, kind of you know, medium growth. We're seeing uh, money going into that sector. Again, that's being driven by a combination of uh, venture capital, private equity interest, uh, but also being uh, driven by increasingly large and longer term incentives around um, uh, CO2 capture and sequestration through uh, government subsidies for that as form of tax credits. And with that in mind, that also decreases methane. So that gets you part of the way there. If you kind of notice, I particularly on this model, don't really put in any carbon pricing or other impacts of where society is taking too many decisions outside of the financial model perspective. And then we take one more and more step in this model where we see if there's a very high set of incentives coming in, technology comes in very strongly around that. And then we have further technology on the methane side. Uh, you can actually get to pretty close where you need to be, including a high amount of renewables uh, subsidies through technology. And I, and I think when you look at that from an investor perspective and the markets look at that, there's going to be a strong push to deliver on technology so where society doesn't actually have to, to do anything. I like to have both, but this is, I think, where the numbers lead you. So what, what does that kind of mean in terms of financial returns and kind of where the investors are looking at short term? So if you look at uh, what's called this, this EIP Climate Tech Index, it's by a large venture uh, capital fund with about $5 billion, I think, under management right now. Uh, they've been tracking um, a number of companies that they've invested in, two plus public companies in the space uh, that are very much climate tech oriented. And if you look at the last three-year basis, uh, that's the green line up here. Uh, climate uh, tech has generally outperformed the NASDAQ and even kind of right now it's just a little above that. So it's generally been a good place to be uh, if you're aiming in, into the public markets. And in terms of deal flow, kind of like Justin mentioned, uh, climate tech um, and carbon tech have generally been <clears throat> pretty good. Even this this last year, it's been it's been stable versus growing. So there's still a number of deals in terms of deal value and deal counts. Uh, going into the sectors, and I think that's going to continue for at least the next five, six years with the push of the Inflation Reduction Act. And so how does uh, CIC uh, look at this and kind of how do we kind of you know, um, enjoy investors to think about this? So uh, the energy markets are, are fairly complicated when you get into this granular level of investing into a single company as uh, the companies are also trying to enter into subsectors of the market, whether it's uh, globally or even within the US. And so what we do is we like to go really fairly deep into the techno-economics of where the opportunities lie. And so this example that we show here uh, is what we did is we looked at um, a number of companies that we did discovery on here, looking at the rights that are in the electrochemical space, which is part of the downstream markets we look at. And this uh, chart here on the left shows what we see the future for methanol technologies. So we identified the best technologies in the market. So we had our PhDs on our team uh, review those. Uh, and then we did long-term forecasting, looking at learning curves, actual site data, where you place these technologies, where you manufacture them, the supply demand of uh, methanol in the markets, uh, the impact of potential uh, taxes and green premiums. And there's two classes of methanol technologies that we looked at, with the best case being that uh, one of those class of technologies become competitive to the top of the methanol price range by 2030, and the other one, best hope, maybe around 2050. And that gives kind of you the, the range of targets if you're going to be an, an, a, a long term investor and where you're trying to be investing in a company in this space, we're saying you have to wait probably about 10 years before you're making any cash out of these projects. And uh, you'd have to be a very long-term investor if you're investing into this much greener category of methanol. And that's uh, how we look at uh, taking investment decisions. So let me um, stop at that. And um, thank you.
Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much. And next we will have Sean Kimiagar with Enverus. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do you have my full screen? Yes, sir. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Okay. So perfect. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, Justin and Alex, thank you all both so much for uh, getting us off to a great start. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Kimiagar. I work at Enveris, which is the world's largest uh, energy dedicated intelligence, um, oil, gas, power, and renewables uh, company. We have data analytics and intelligence. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Uh, my email address is here. Feel free to reach out uh, through email or LinkedIn. As a, now, as a new member to Feng, I'm happy to be here. And this morning, I will be briefly talking about and touching on some trends in the oil and gas uh, upstream sector, and very briefly uh, talking about capital efficiency and capital discipline, which uh, um, Justin mentioned as well, break-evens across the U.S. lower 48 and uh, mergers and acquisitions. So, you know, every day on the calendar has three dozen national days, and I felt like for, you know, 50 plus people who are willing to join a call uh, on industry topics at seven in the morning, uh, it would be appropriate to celebrate National Public Sleeping Day, even if your public sleep happens to be at your own desk at 2 p.m. after work. So, happy National Public Sleeping Day. Um, a little bit about who I am, 30 seconds or so. Uh, I'm a geologist by background. I got my bachelor and master's degree in petroleum geology from Texas, uh, from uh, Petroleum Institute and University of Texas at Arlington and uh, MBA from uh, Texas A&M Mays Business School. Uh, interned at BHP Billiton, worked on Offshore Brazil Project, worked, on, worked at Halliburton, working on projects in uh, Australia, Marcellus and Gulf of Mexico, Director of Business Development, Middle East, based out of Abu Dhabi for CNC Reservoirs. Uh, I was an investment banker for, for a few years at Dietrich Energy Advisors, A&D across Lower 48. And I've been at Enveris, artist formerly known as Drilling Info, for just over three and a half years now in technical and corporate strategy roles. Now, I don't have any text on the disclaimer slide, just that um, if you are planning on making ungodly amounts of investments, please... Uh, Give me a call so I can put you in touch with the, the people who can dig deeper into all of this data before you uh, commit millions of dollars to something. Uh, these are my opinions, my thoughts on certain trends uh, across the upstream oil and gas. Now, jumping right into it, um, you know, oil and gas uh, have been building blocks of economies around the world for, for decades. And of course, recently with the war in Ukraine, natural gas has found added importance as well, which has led to billions of dollars in new investments in the segment, which is great for that segment of industry. But with all the talk about, you know, clash of oil and gas and renewables and, uh, and whatnot, it's important to pause and remember that there's a place for them all in the energy mix. On the left-hand side, we can see that uh, the increase in demand in oil and gas over the next three decades, as well as a huge increase in demand and consumption for renewables. And on the right-hand side, we can see why that is the case. As population grows and we need more energy, we will need more electric power, more energy for transportation and industrial electric power. Much of it will come from natural gas, as well as renewables, industrials, and transportation from oil and gas for the most part. So there's a, there's a place for all kinds of industry, all kinds of energies across the across the mix. Now, operators, it's it's been interesting, uh, and Justin touched on the uh, capital discipline. Um, the, over the past few years, if you look at the rhetoric, it's been it's gone from we would like to live close to our cash flow to we would like to live within our cash flow to more recently where all hell free cash flow. Uh, and you see that across a lot of the companies, you see that across uh, a lot of the major companies. You look at look at the investment relation material on on the big companies. You certainly see it, and uh, you see it across the board, large, small, and uh, medium sized companies. Um, so, uh, and this is also, by the way, good news for uh, the shareholders because uh, this is either going to 
take that money and uh, put it in their pockets in, in the form of dividends, or it's going to be reinvested back in the business, serving as uh, you know, serving a desperate need for investments following a few years of underinvestment in the major um, oil and gas projects during COVID. And you know, Alex mentioned the same sort of uh, investment needs for the climate as well. So there's a lot of need for for investment across the energy mix, and hopefully we'll, we're seeing quite a bit of quite a bit of that in in these uh, in these markets as well and in the next couple of years. So again, so going from capital discipline uh, along the same lines, talking about capital efficiency, uh, we can see that operators are leaning more toward increasing capital efficiency as opposed to drill baby drill of the past. Um, while operators do have the intention of improving their capital uh, efficiency, though, we do see that there may be a little bit of a decrease, a little bit of a dip in efficiency during 2023. And uh, that is mostly driven by um, oil field cost uh, inflation. Uh, and that's pretty natural because, you know, every time you have a downturn and layoffs across oil field services, OFS, uh, when OFS staff and equipment are laid off, bringing them back is going to have at least a temporary inflationary effect. Um, and then uh, that, though, could be offset by a lot of the operators improving their productivity. And we'll talk, we, we'll touch on a couple of those metrics through geology development strategies and so on, which, again, we'll touch on um, a little bit. And on that note, uh, it's good to jump right into uh, well spacing. So uh, if you're if you uh, you know if you're not familiar with the parent-child terminology in the oil and gas industry, uh, not to worry. Um, think of a parent well as one when um, all neighbors are drilled after this well has come. Um, online. So there's less disturbance to its production. And think of a child well as one that is drilled with at least one nearby neighbor, meaning there may be a production interference between the, the, the two, so the child well and its parent well uh, in the subsurface, leading to production degradation. So as we run out of inventory, as we run out of uh, places to drill, we're going to have more and more child wells. And as you can see the trend here over the years, we've gone from quite a few parent wells to next to no parent wells. And this is across five major reasons across uh, the lower 48. Again, I'm, I'm generalizing a lot of these, uh, looking at all of lower 48 for the most part. If you have any questions, happy to dig deeper with you um, offline as well. So that's what we were seeing in terms of trends. Um, but uh, so operators need to be more cognizant of that, need to be take measures to uh, develop their um, acreage, their, uh, their, their land better. Um, and um, speaking of, um, you know, getting more out of what you're putting in, you know, we're seeing, uh, we can see that, uh, you know, as, as long as the price of oil uh, stays near what it is, this was this morning or last night, uh, as long as the price of oil remains where it is, and we believe that it will likely reach about $100 in, uh, in 2023 as well, almost all lower 48 uh, production will be economical and can see uh, you can see how good Permian is doing as well. What we're looking at here is break-even points. So, you know, how how much is it going to cost? Uh, at what price point will we reach break-even of a barrel of oil equivalent? Um, and you know, the reason we're thinking that it would uh, likely reach $100 is because as China opens up, as demand uh, increases, we believe by about a million barrels a day by the end of the year. Uh, production may not match that. We believe about 400,000 of it may be matched by U.S. production. If OPEC is reluctant to increase production, then we're going to end up with a um, smaller supply versus uh, demand. And we looked at break-evens across a number of uh, regions. This is Permian specific, but also you can find the same trend across most of the regions. You can see that um, operators over the years have gone in Permian from 2010 to 2022, over about a decade, from about $60 break even down to about 30 or so. And you can see this trend. So the, the industry is becoming more efficient, and this is good. And you, you may see drop in number of rigs in certain areas, but that doesn't mean lower production. It just means those rigs are drilling multiple wells. It means that the wells they're drilling are more efficient. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna touch on uh, two slides on, on M&A and wrap up with these two slides. In 2022, mergers and acquisition trends, um, you can see here that when we look at all transactions across lower 48, we see a healthy mix uh, across all regions, both by number of deals. You can see that all, most regions, all, most main regions are represented, uh, as well as by value. 
But what we also see is that Permian, for instance, has a large number of deals and large value, meaning higher value deals. Midcon has quite a few deals, but a pretty small value. So that's probably smaller deals altogether. And taking a look at um, M&A in terms of buyer and seller universe, what we can see is that uh, across uh, 2022, most of the sellers have been private and uh, PE backed, private equity backed companies. A lot of these publics here are corporate takeovers, uh, but a lot, of, most of the assets being uh, changing hands, the sellers have been PE and uh, private companies, and um, the buyer universe has been mostly mostly publics. And what this tells us, bringing us back to capital discipline, is that private equities who are interested in growth, you know, fast and now, um, seem to be cashing out a little bit to a certain extent, while larger publics um, are seeing the value in this free cash flow. They're looking at it uh, at a longer term um, value of these deals, and they are willing to be patient with it. And uh, with that, um, I would like to thank you all for your time. And please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Excellent. Thank you kindly, Sean. And we will move on swiftly to our next distinguished speaker, Miss Anna Miksulka. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for having me. So I'm Anna Mikolska. I, have, I am a fellow for energy studies at the Baker Institute Center for Energy Studies. And I focus mostly on geopolitics of energy, especially natural gas uh, in uh, uh, Europe and uh, Russia, with, of course, a uh, focus on, on, on the US as one of the major uh, supplier there as well. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about what happened in Europe and how that kind of uh, affected uh, both European energy security and potential for growth, as well as energy transition. Uh, I'll touch up upon that and, and also how, this, um, how the US um, oil and gas industry stepped in. Uh, so I'm gonna just share my screen as I have uh, several, um, no, I had a share screen and, oh yes, it is. Okay, good, good, good. Um, it's supposed to be easy. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, so um, I have several. Um, ah, here it is. Um, I have several slides. Mostly, it's it's graphs kind of to show what was happening in the European market uh, since uh, since the war in Ukraine began, or since the Russian invaded Ukraine. But even actually a little bit more. Um, so if you see here on uh, uh, on the pipeline gas um, uh, flows to Europe, you actually do see that the pipeline flows to Europe have decreased. In, it's natural gas, of course, uh, uh, in Europe in already in 2021. Uh, and that was almost um, what we see is a preparation to make the European uh, gas market very difficult. And Russia has used natural gas uh, many, many times over many decades as, um, as a tool for geopolitics. And this time it deployed it just as well already in 2021 20, by actually only delivering on, um, on contracted vo uh, volumes. Uh, and actually not really from Russia, it was uh, basically uh, getting those volume out of its own storage in Europe. And at and and the same time, emptying the storage ahead of the winter of 2021, 2022, as opposed to actually filling it up, which created already issues in at the end of the 2021, when economies in Europe started growing uh, after, uh, after COVID, and there was this uh, uh, realization that there might not be enough gas for the winter, particularly if that if the winter is cold. Um, and we see, as soon as the shooting war began, we saw the drop in your, uh, in Russian gas, significant, uh, significant, almost up to really I think 10% of the gas that used to flow to Russia, uh, to, from Russia to Europe, flows now through pipelines, mostly through Turkey Stream. And so uh, from uh, from uh, through Turkey and uh, some of it still through Ukraine, uh, not much, but some of it uh, nevertheless. And of course, well, what we could what we could think of as well, if if there is not enough gas flowing uh, to Europe, uh, prices are going to go up. Uh, sure enough, 
um, European prices have gone up significantly. Um, these are actually monthly, uh, monthly averages. Um, on a day-by-day -day basis, they've re reached $90 per MMBTU um, in August, end of August. So these were huge, huge prices, uh, far above, um, above the, um, uh, the, the prices in, in Asia. So what happened to Europe? Why, why did it happen? Well, um, basically, Europeans over, uh, had a strong over-reliance on Russian energy, especially natural gas, which, as everybody knows here, uh, it's very difficult to deliver unless you have a set infrastructure in place. And mostly that was the Russian infrastructure, particularly in Western Europe has really kind of uh, uh, didn't pay attention to what Russia could do if there was an over-reliance on gas. Um, there was underestimation on um, uh, Russia readiness to use gas flows uh, for geopolitical purposes. Again, mostly Western Europe, Eastern Europe and Central Europe have been warning countries like Germany, Italy to not over-rely on Russian gas and then actually general lack of alternatives for immediate and seamless substitution of natural gas that would flow from, uh, from uh, Russia. So not only there was not enough gas that would flow from other locations, but also uh, there was just not enough energy from other sources. And what we have actually seen, we have seen bringing in back coal in many countries, uh, including Germany, uh, Netherlands, um, and others, uh, Poland, and so on. Um, and uh, Keeping nuclear in Germany beyond its legally uh, its legal, legal limits of this year, um, it's supposed to be still um, actually taken out of the grid uh, in uh, I think in several weeks actually, but um, but that's kind of we can we can discuss that um, nevertheless. Europe also, as soon as the invasion began, Europe also um, acknowledged that natural gas and nuclear could be decarbonizing fuels uh, in their taxonomy. So that's actually quite important because it could provide and has provided already um, an element of, uh, that could uh, help with, uh, with infrastructure uh, investment and so on. And we've seen it actually um, as well. So the prices have been exorbitant. They have fallen now. I don't I think this is this is only till end of the year. They have fall, fallen now significantly, I think below 50. Um, 50 euros, which is like, I think, uh, 15 or 15 and so on MMBTUs. Um, they're still higher than they used to be before invasion, although uh, much, much uh, at a much be better uh, level. The difference is not there. But what really kind of these, I mean, what, what Europe tried to do if you don't have obviously enough energy from gas and from other resources, well, you cut on the use, right? So you Europe's tried to introduce energy efficiency measure, uh, tried to curtail demand, and, and uh, it was able to pay really high prices. What you see here is the drop in industrial use of natural gas in uh, major industrial, um, industrial areas in Europe. We've seen this significant drop, uh, especially chemical and fertilizer industries have been hit uh, quite a lot. They try to come back right now, but it's not easy because really there is no certainty about how, how uh, long will the lower prices last and whether they're not gonna uh, go back to really, really high, high levels. And um, this, is, this is Germany actually. So you, you see that the manufacturing has, has truly uh, decreased uh, in those uh, places because of high energy prices, natural gas prices, but of, of course also the um, electricity have, uh, prices have increased since natural gas is a, is a feedstock for, is a, is a generating fuel and it needs to be either, uh, it, it became the, the marginal uh, fuel for, for all, the, um, uh, all the electricity and it was very uh, high in terms of, in terms of cost. So um, one place where the Europeans were able to get some gas in, uh, uh, to, to replace some of the, uh, the, the, the Russian gas supply was of course the US. And what you see here is actually the US LNG exports um, <clears throat> monthly. And I think the important part was that it, the US LNG sector has really overperformed um, that they 
many times they actually operated not only at base design capacity, but above the design capacity, and at some point, even above the peak design capacity. Um, we see the drop here in July, that's report happening now, happening here, but you see still actually the, 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 the uh, hike uh, after, afterwards. Um, Freeport is coming back online slowly, so this could, uh, would improve. But it's actually important to under, uh, underscore how much of uh, the US LNG exports have helped to fill in the void that Russian gas has left in the markets. And that's actually important to underscore why we, we haven't really seen this in the oil markets, but as much at least as we have seen it in, uh, in the um, gas markets. It's because the Russian gas that has not been delivered to Europe for so long doesn't have a place to go. Uh, the uh, Western Siberia, where this gas, the gas flows were coming from to Europe, do not have connection to other places. So if they don't go to Europe, they can go only go to the Russian uh, storage or be used by, uh, by, uh, by Russia domestically. What goes to actually what flows to China is from Eastern Siberia, completely not connected with, with, with the West. So if you now, if you have so much gas disappearing, uh, what fills the void? Um, other resources like coal or nuclear, and uh, and of course LNG, uh, trying to fill the void. Now, we see that actually EU LNG uh, import terminals worked over time as well, um, especially in north northwest. And in fact, there had there was an issue at some point that there was enough LNG floating around Europe, but the capacity utilization wasn't there, particularly in Northwest Europe, which is not uh, which is not connected sufficiently with Southern Europe, Europe like uh, like Spain and Portugal that had enough capacity utilization but couldn't move it further to to Germany, for example, because there is no pipeline capacity to do that. And we've seen uh, here just um, kind of to, 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 uh, to uh, illustrate how that US LNG, what US LNG meant to Europe, you see that this increase in LNG, uh, LNG exports uh, from US has become ma major, major part of US, uh, of EU LNG imports. So going forward, just very quickly, Europe is generally well set now because it got storage is relatively high. You can see it here. Um, it's high because um, Europe was able to fill its storage by November 1st to at least 90% everywhere. And that's by law, actually. By law, in Germany was 95%. By EU law, 80% of storage needed to be filled by, uh, by uh, November 1st. Next year, the EU law uh, uh, requires 90% fill. Now, warm weather really, really helped this year. This was not what was expected. So going forward, uh, will US, uh, will EU have enough, um, enough um, gas? Depends how the winter goes. We're still not out of the winter. Depends if, if China picks up, uh, picks up uh, demand for LNG. It was sending it to Europe um, last year. And it depends whether uh, uh, Europe is willing, how much Europe is really willing to pay because prices might be high again. Thank you very much for listening to me. Please make sure you connect uh, on LinkedIn with me, but also with, uh, uh, with the Baker Institute Center for Energy Studies. And I can actually, I will um, post this, uh, all this information in the chat uh, now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the comprehensive update. Um, uh, Dr. McSulka. So um, next, and yeah, please do uh, join the the Baker Institute, or you know, they they have a great you know nonpartisan um, information on there and on all on all uh, industries, especially the energy industry. And so next, we will be having the uh, distinguished Mr. John Saucer from Mobius Risk Group. Thank you. And John, you you you're, you're you're using my trick there of putting yourself on mute. Hey, good morning, everybody. On. There we go. Hey, can you see my um? Can you see my share? Uh, we can, yes, sir. Okay.
I can't see it, but um, anyway, hey, this is John Saucer uh, at Mobius Risk Group. Uh, Mark and everyone, thanks very much for including us. Uh, Mobius Risk Group is a uh, commodity risk advisory firm. Uh, we work with producers, consumers, and capital market participants who have exposure, whether it's to the physical commodities, interest rates, or currencies. Uh, we're based in Houston, Texas. Um, my background is in oil markets and oil market research. I uh, got my start at Argus, uh, worked at Citibank for more than 10 years, worked at a hedge fund and research and trading, and I've been at Mobius for eight years. I wear two hats here, head of oil markets and uh, VP of strategy and business development. So I'll be wearing the oil market hat uh, today. Um, I want to be able to see my screen. So um, hang on a second here. You may have to change the view that you're in, John. Yeah, all I see is your uh, your name, Mark. Mm. If you double click on that, it might switch from cameras and. Now I see you. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I can only apologize. Okay, hang on a second. Share. Okay. All right. I can see this. Can you see this? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Sir. Um, I'm going to go to the first couple of slides. Um, what I really want to start with is uh, a, a talk about price signals, uh, because what I would like to highlight is the fact that over the last uh, three months in particular, uh, things have changed dramatically from a fundamental uh, perspective, particularly as we look into um, the back half of 2023. But um, flat price really hasn't been sending any signals. Um, at the bottom of the slide, slide two, uh, you have CME. Uh, oh, it just went away. We can still see the slide, John, if you want to talk through it. OK, yeah. Um, so what we're seeing is um, basically over the last few months, um, the fixed price has not sent us any signal whatsoever. Whether it's WTI or Brent, we've been largely locked down in a range and that hasn't changed this week and it may not change in the next few weeks but what we would like to highlight is the fact um as you go to slide three can you see the next slide that's my issue i can't switch the slides here um okay you, you can uh, just go out and switch the slide again or we're on slide two currently sir okay so i'm gonna go to slide three and talk about slide four what I'd like to stress is that the market has been sending very important signals over the last three months that not have been that have not been evidence in flat price. Uh, we put a lot more gravitas on what term structure or curve shape tells us, uh, what crack spreads tell us, and what other sort of uh, key arbitrage tells us. And uh, there, we've been seeing some really interesting signals that uh, confirm sort of a transformation of fundamentals over the last uh, three months. And what I mean is that. While we're not back to our all time highs back in the second quarter or first quarter of 2022, right after the invasion, uh, we're seeing backwardation uh, reemerge in the crude market. Uh, likewise, we're seeing strength in Asia reemerge in the crude market. It was very much absent in the second half of last year. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that because what I mean is that, you know, flat price hasn't done much, uh, but and WTI remains in a slight contango if you look at the first month spread on the futures curve. So the nearby spreads and WTI remain in a slight contango uh, or flat. Interestingly, Brent has established a slight John, backward. Do mind, John, do you mind explaining contango and backwardation for some of the folks in the audience that may not know? Yeah. So when, when a market's in contango, that's a cost of carrier storage market. That's an indication the market is balanced to glutted. Uh, a deep contango would, would be a market paying you to take barrels off the market and store them for the future. So that's basically a prompt discount and a premium in the future. A backwardation is an indication of a tight market where the prompt into the curve or the nearby is trading at a premium to the future, indicating the type of premium that's being paid for prompt molecules. It's the type of curve shape that would also penalize someone for hoarding or holding a barrel or a molecule the next month because uh, next month is trading at a discount to the prompt. So a backwardation is an indication of a very tight market, a market that's in deficit, and a contango is an indication of a market that's either balanced or moving to a surplus. So during the middle of last year, obviously we had a very tight market uh, post invasion. But during the back half of last year, there was a lot of discounting of that. A lot of people focused on, you know, Jerome Powell rate hikes, the Fed rate hikes, 
expectations of a recession in the U.S. and elsewhere, basically a really extreme recession. And also last year, we had some pretty you know negative outlooks on uh, Chinese economic activity for 2022, and that flowed through into the outlook for 2023. So uh, the point here is that since November, since Thanksgiving, since we've seen this transformation in China, while flat price has not in any way reflected any change or sent any sort of meaningful signals, curve shape has. And it's very regionally specific. And what I mean is that WTI is still trading at a slight contango on the front end of its forward curve. Brent's trading at a slight backwardation. And most importantly, Dubai, which is the sour benchmark used in Asia, is trading at a steep backwardation. That's really important because if you go back to the end of the third quarter, early fourth, fourth quarter of last year, um, the market for sour crude and the market for uh, OPEC barrels in Asia was glutted. And uh, basically starting in October of last year, the Saudis began cutting prices uh, consistently. Likewise, it was in early October of last year that OPEC, led by Saudi Arabia, decided they were going to cut their uh, quotas by 2 million and probably net uh, actual output cut of about 1 million barrels a day, which we saw uh, in uh, November of last year. So um, the market in Asia has transformed dramatically. You know, we have a situation now where OPEC was cutting barrels at the beginning of the first fourth quarter, and they were cutting prices month after month after month. Uh, well, I would say the worm has turned because we have demand now that's driving a very strong prompt premium in Asia. And it's also allowed the Saudis to increase their contract prices for March for the first time since last September. And that's a very important tell in the, in the signal in terms of the confidence uh, for, for demand. So uh, while there's a lot of questions about order of magnitude, of demand recovery, and we're going to talk about that in a little more detail in a second. Uh, this backwardation and the fact that it's uh, in Asia uh, tells us that Asia is uh, leading uh, on the demand recovery, as would be accepted with uh, the rebound uh, in China. The other thing I want to point out to is that you see this also reflected in arbitrage. And what I mean is the spread between WTI crude in the US and benchmark Brent in Europe. We've seen WTI weaken versus Europe, or conversely, Europe strengthen versus the US. More importantly, we've seen Asia strengthen versus both Brent and WTI. So at the beginning of the year, uh, Dubai was probably trading closer to $4.50 under Brent. As of right now, it's more like $1.60. So the ARBs and the curves are telling us that the global market's tightening. It's doing so very rapidly, and it's coming from Asia first. Uh, and that makes sense. And I, and I want to sort of go ahead and talk a little bit about those OPEC production cuts, too. So I'm going to jump to slide five, if you can see that. So we did see a cut of about a million barrels a day in OPEC production in November. There was a bit of a rebound in December, then a bit of a trail off in, in, in January. But the bottom line is OPEC has taken off just over a million barrels a day from the market since um, November 1st. Uh, I would say the impact has been meaningful alongside what's been going on with demand recovery in Asia. And what I mean is that if you look at what was going on in November, December, January, and even February, um, they were cutting volume and cutting prices. March is a significant month for them because, uh, again, they were able to raise contract prices on their term customers for the first time since last September. So, again, that's a very important tell in the market. And coming back to the original theme of these slides is, hey, uh, flat price is not really sending any sort of signal. We're just sort of locked down in this push-pull between – concerns over more rate hikes and optimism about demand recovery this year. So that could continue and could continue to keep, you know, flat price, particularly for crude, locked in a very well-defined range, even as fundamentals uh, tighten um, what we think in a very uh, pronounced fashion. I do want to jump to slide six and talk about uh, global demand forecast, because I think this is one of the most important things that has been sort of missed in the market, uh, particularly in the last few months. Uh, last year, if you look at the bottom of this table in 2022, global oil demand growth, whether you use the IEA or OPEC, grew at you know 2.5 million barrels a day. That's a really important number, and I want to focus on that for a second because if you go back and look at history, and specifically look at the 20 years before the pandemic, so the years 2000 to 2019, global oil demand typically increased on average, you know, about 1.25 million barrels a day. And the lion's share of that, certainly half to two thirds of that came from uh, demand growth in Asia, Southern Asia, and specifically China. What's interesting about last year is that global oil demand basically grew at two times the historic rate. And yet last year, Chinese oil demand contracted 
China's economy last year was one of the worst economies we'd seen in decades. And that's one of the worst oil demand performances we've seen uh, similarly. Yet global oil demand still grew at two times the rate we saw on average between 20, uh, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 2000 and 2019. So again, as we look ahead to this year, we've been getting some of our early forecasts. And what we've seen very recently is a propensity to have upper revisions. And that shouldn't surprise us because a lot has changed just since um, late last year. Um, some of the banks, uh, a lot of the research teams are now sort of, you know, dialing down their expectations in terms of recessionary impact in the EU and potentially in the U.S. as well. Uh, I also think the market did a fabulous job in the back half of last year, discounting in the mother of all recessions with crude prices going from 120 down to 70 and the curve going from backwardated uh, to contango, at least in the case of WTI. So I think um, at this point, the market will be surprised. It sort of did a surprise mode. What I want to talk about this year is the fact that it looks like global oil demand may be growing more in line with the pace we saw in 2022. A lot of people had penciled in a slowdown in 2023. Um, that included the IEA, that included OPEC, that included the US DOE. And we may have a marginal slowdown. I mean, OPEC's looking for growth this year of 2.37 versus 2.47 last year. IEA is actually now closer to 2 million barrels a day of growth versus 2.55, but we're going to probably see some additional uh, upper revisions there. So I guess my point is it becomes really important because many people in the market were anticipating that the market would move into a surplus or market that would create a contango curve structure, when in fact that's not likely to be the case. And what I mean is now basically the IEA is penciling in average growth for oil demand this year of 2 million barrels a day. And in their latest report, just released just about two weeks ago, they finally copped to the fact that they can only find about 1.2 million barrels a day of supply growth. Um, what I would tell you is that it's a very, very meaningful admission. Uh, likewise, the fact that they're now expecting, you know, a pretty pronounced deficit. They say it's backloaded in the second half of this year, and that may be the case. But they're also saying, on average, it could average 800,000 barrels a day over the year. So if it's backloaded, it means it's materially larger in the second half of the year. So again, we're in a market where uh, we're going to continue to see uh, deficits um, uh, due to uh, much stronger than expected demand and also uh, because of the OPEC production cuts. The other thing I wanted to mention about those OPEC production cuts, I'm not going to go back to that slide just yet, but I also want to highlight some things to consider. OPEC is now OPEC plus. So part of the market tightness on the supply side is the increased uh, efficacy of uh, the Russian sanctions on, on crude oil. It's not so much the government activities or rules, but the fact that it's very difficult now to get insurance and letters of credit to uh, load these type of ships. So uh, over time, that's sort of clamping that down alongside the concrete actions um, taken by OPEC. So, you know, broadly speaking, we have a theme this year where demand growth remains dynamic. Demand growth continues to exceed expectations, while on the supply side, we're seeing um, com contraction in OPEC+. plus potentially further uh, con uh, contraction from Russia within that. And likewise, even on the non opex part of the equation, while we're seeing growth, um, it's just not very dynamic, particularly in the US. I would highlight the fact that three years after the pandemic, uh, roughly, uh, we've still not gotten back uh, to our all-time high US production that we achieved in the fourth quarter of 2019, um, this, despite a lot of effort. So um, this demand miss is probably going to be the one of the things that causes the most heartburn this year because again uh, demand could be well over two million barrels a day of growth uh it could be you know at a pace that's like largely double uh, what we we're seeing over the long-term average and it's also a pattern that doesn't really fit the narrative of peak oil demand or expecting that oil demand is going to peak and i want to mention another thing about these numbers so look at the top half of this table in 2023, both IEA and OPEC are looking for average demand of 101.9 million barrels. That's unequivocally a new all-time high. So, you know, we're, we're still lucky to see some upper revisions here, but we're already at a new all-time high. So, again, the demand picture, I think, is incredibly dynamic and incredibly supportive because the rate of change remains massive. Demand certainly is, you know, pushing towards new all-time highs. Uh, and uh, there's many in the market that still, you know, are sort of, expecting that demand's going to go away um, immediately or that peak oil demand's here. And what I'm telling you is it may be coming, but it's certainly not here. Uh, the evidence over the last two years is that we are consuming a lot more than we did uh, in the uh, years uh, just prior uh, the, to the pandemic. 
I'm going to skip over uh, chart seven and eight, other than to say that we watch these metrics in China very closely. I think China is very hard to get sort of a gauge on demand there. So what we tend to do is focus in on their crude imports because as they dial up refinery activity and they do have some fair capacity there, unlike the US and Europe, uh, that's a pretty good indication. So we do tend to focus on their crude imports and their crude runs and we get that data from their uh, customs administration and from the IEA. The other thing we like to look at too is their product exports because we think that's a pretty good gauge on uh, domestic demand. As domestic demand goes up, their exports of gasoline and diesel in particular uh, tend to trail off. As you can see, late last year, there was a surge. If you look at the charts on the far right on number seven, the red one for gasoline, and the blue one for diesel, you can see that there was a surge in exports late last year. That's when China agreed in uh, September to stop hoarding and begin exporting. But what it also suggests is as demand locally and domestically picks up in China in the coming months, uh, those bars are going to fall steeply again. So that's why we're going to keep a close tab on, on that. Likewise, in China, there's other metrics that we use to sort of keep an eye on how robust things are because we're not really trusting of the implied demand data. We look at auto sales. We look at power consumption, which is particularly useful. Uh, we look at uh, some housing starts, sometimes useful, sometimes not. Of late, what we find particularly useful is metro ridership data. Uh, it's not provided by the government. It's provided by Weibo. Uh, it's in the largest cities. We've built an index of the 10 largest cities. As you can see on the bottom left, um, uh, metro ridership or subway ridership has really taken off and is approaching some of the highest levels we've seen since the start of the pandemic. And all this is very important. So again, turning to slide nine, and I want to stress this because we're all located in the U.S. and we're going to be inundated with sort of U.S. data and European data. The, the demand picture in the U.S. and Europe isn't that great. Uh, as you can see by this chart, demand is running below where we were uh, last year, uh, below where we were um, and 2019. So again, um, at least right now, um, we're in a bit of a lull. But what I would stress about US demand and to an extent European demand is that they're never really the major driver for global demand growth uh, on an annualized basis. Whether we're talking about that 20 year period between 2000 and 2019, or talking about going forward, you know, the US can add a couple hundred here and there. Europe is usually pretty much flat. Japan has been you know, virtually zero uh, for the last few years. So really, uh, again, you know, you can see a situation where the U.S. continues to slog along at these lackluster demand levels. You can see a situation where Europe continues to slog along at fairly lackluster demand levels, but the demand upside elsewhere is strong enough to more than offset that. Because that was really the case during that 20 years between 2000 and 2019. I think that'll be the case this year and the next few years, just in a much more pronounced fashion. The other thing I wanted to mention going to slide 10 is that one thing in the U.S. that domestic demand doesn't capture is the amount of products that we're exporting. The U.S. has been one of the largest supporters of diesel to Europe alongside Russia for a decade and a half. Likewise, the U.S. is one of the largest supporters of products in the Latin America. We support half of export, half of Mexico's uh, domestic consumption of gasoline. So what we've seen in recent months is pretty much record levels of U.S. product export. So I want to point that out because, you know, the U.S. demand numbers are not that great, but they don't reflect the fact that we're exporting a lot of material off the Gulf Coast. I know we were talking about LNG earlier. I know when we talk about oil, everyone thinks about crude exports, but know that right now uh, we're exporting uh, LNG, lots of crude, lots of product, lots of methanol, lots of petrochemicals, and lots of NGL. So, um, this is just refined product exports. What I'm telling you is U.S. demand domestically may be lackluster, but uh, the pool on our coast for all these other molecules remains very, very strong. And it's clearly tied to the recovery on the other side of the world. I um, want to spend a couple minutes talking about the SPR on slide 11. Um, basically, the blue line reflects the drawdown of SPR from almost 600 million barrels to uh, something around, uh, I think, 360. Uh, the individual bars represent the weekly draws, and you see they've come to zero in recent weeks. So we're at important transition time because there's a lot of questions about the SPR. Are we going to continue to draw? Well, the government and the Biden administration did agree to pull out another 26 million barrels uh, in the second quarter, but that's an insignificant volume vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we've done uh, previously. So I wouldn't um, be too concerned with that. I would say the main takeaway with the SPR is that it's likely to be a non-issue uh, for the balance of the year. And what I mean is that I don't think you're gonna see much more in the way of withdrawals, you know, taking into account the, the 26 million we're seeing for the second uh, quarter. 
Likewise, I think the probability of refill uh, is very low and much lower than people recognize. And what I mean is I don't think, A, uh, we're going to be able to exercise the $70 put that was discussed where the U.S. government would buy crude below $70 to refill the SPR. Uh, A, because I don't think prices are going to trade there. But I think the most important thing to remember is we have a new Congress, new leadership by a new party. Uh, we weren't able to fill the SPR or agree um, uh, at $24 to fill the SPR. I think it would be very difficult uh, in the current congressional environment to agree to fill it at 70 or 80. So, again, and I don't think the John, um, as much as I would love to just, you know, li listen to you um, continue on with this fantastic information, um, if you can, you know, uh, wrap it up for us, this is really excellent. I did, you know, I allowed some extra time for you to continue on because this is really pertinent information. But you can, you know, uh, reach out to John and he'll share these slides with you or, you know, he can do a personal one on one with you because this is great information. Um, perfect. So, our, our, and so thank you very much, uh, John, and, and for our, because I want to be cognizant of time. Um, for our, our next uh, speaker, we'll have Mr. Pedro uh, Blanco from uh, Capturient. Thank you very much. Cheers, John. Uh, hello. Uh, good morning. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, a little bit of uh, time constraint here. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Mark. Thank you for inviting me. Well, uh, Pedro Blanco, I'm a managing director of Ventoro Securities. Well, today I'm going to be wearing the, the hat uh, of uh, Capturian, which is one of our new ventures, uh, mostly related to the ESG and carbon market, so mostly to the E on ESG. And um, just wanted to uh, go to a few slides and explain what we're doing regarding uh, that industry and that uh, it's just a new financial tool uh, for traders of uh, carbon credits to participate. So uh, um, as we have seen on all these presentations, uh, there's going to be a lot of growth that is expected on the climate tech and uh, also on any financial tool that is related to climate and uh, energy transition, even though we see a, a still a huge participation on the oil and gas um, activities. Uh, one of the tools that have been developed in the market to uh, help uh, many of the governments and uh, to tackle with climate change has been the use of carbon credits and carbon offsets. As you know, the market has two types of uh, this uh, uh, credits, which one is the voluntary market and the other one is the compliance market. Uh, the compliance market, mostly in Europe and, and several uh, jurisdictions, so probably California, where you have you know mandated uh, caps on uh, emissions and you have to offset them with some credits. And mostly the rest of the world is working on the voluntary credit market, which is uh, people are able to issue credits by uh, saving or sequestering or capturing CO2, and they can issue credits for you know other industries that produce those CO2 and offset them in the market. So uh, the carbon credit is just another tool. Uh, it's a simple and straightforward way uh, to meet some of those ESG requirements that are coming into the market. So um, getting a little bit more into the carbon credit uh, details, um, the majority of the credits today are what we call nature-based. Um, they are created by companies that um, plant trees or protect areas in the world where you have big forests and they, you know, calculate uh, the amount of CO2 that those uh, forests uh, generates or save, uh, you know, uh, to being uh, emitted into the atmosphere. So um, what we're trying to do here in Capturian is to tackle where the real majority of greenhouse gases are, uh, you know, emissions come from, which is mostly, you know, the oil and gas industry, coal, petrochemicals, and power generation. 
So what we are creating is a first of the kind uh, carbon reduction projects uh, which are aimed at the most uh, emission intensive industries in the market. Uh, for example, we created very recently a methodology. Actually, he's here in the U.S. and in one of the biggest, you know, uh, oil producing uh, places in, in the U.S., which is the Permian. Uh, we created a product where mineral right owners can uh, sequester those minerals and issue carbon credits based on the amount of CO2 that will not be produced by not uh, producing those uh, oil barrels into the market. So uh, it's uh, it's kind of disruptive. Uh, a lot of you know, uh, there's a lot. There were a lot of public announcements about it, but they are already on the market, and actually they are considered high quality carbon credits because, uh, as in difference with the forest carbon credits, where the calculation of those CO2s that are captured by trees, uh, which is new new technology and new science, uh, the oil industry. Uh, has been very precise and very thin. It's a, it's a science and engineer based uh, uh, technology that we clearly can calculate the exact amount of barrels that you can sequester. So uh, that's why many of the uh, industries that are buying carbon credits are seeing this as a high carbon uh, market. And we are trying to develop that market uh, not only in the US, but to the rest of the world. So um, why, why there are barriers to growth and what are the solutions we're bringing to the table? Well, right now, uh, the, the, the current players uh, are not coming from the energy producing industries. Mostly these are uh, uh, entities that come from you know, NGOs, uh, which were created uh, due to you know, climate policies that were issued by the UN, you know, we're starting with the Kyoto Protocol and it was the Paris Agreement. And um, what we're trying to bring uh, to the market is a little bit more of private sector uh, design of this uh, credit, which we're actually changing the name to environmental assets, which will not only be based on carbon, because we're bringing those, of, uh, those assets based mostly on not only carbon, but methane, uh, water rights, uh, resilience uh, bonds, and many other tools that we think can help um, the industry to have different tools to tackle you know, climate change or uh, energy transition or whatever you wanna call it. Um, what we're trying to bring with Capturian, it's uh, a standard more close to a security industry, okay? Where we can see some compliance and risk management approach so those voluntary market, instead of being directed to people who have budgets for, you know, PR uh, purposes or, you know, philanthropic purposes, this can really be a financial tool that companies and investors can put in their portfolio uh, and, and will help uh, industries to comply with all the regulations that are in place and the regulations that are coming. Uh, so this will deliver a broad uh, range of investments and bring into the table not only companies that want to participate on the voluntary market, but we are seeing companies like hedge funds, uh, even pension funds, even investment ETFs are starting to show interest on this asset because instead of being more as a voluntary you know, credit that um, was issued by an NGO, uh, this time we're seeing, you know, a, a real asset, a real security that you can put in your balance sheet or in your investment portfolio uh, and help uh, with the policies that are being uh, issued. And of course, well, what we're doing also to help on that is we are creating uh, uh, using an exchange, which is the first uh, a regulated exchange in the world for this kind of credits. And with that, we would like to help with liquidity and transparency on those markets. So, um, well, that's that's mainly the tool we're creating. And uh, we just wanted to uh, start, uh, actually we were just approved uh, last week on that exchange and we're just, you know, starting development the market uh, for, for those assets. So, um, well, that's... Uh,
that's how that's what I have. I want to be brief. And, and uh, if you have any questions, please reach out uh, to me and Mark. Thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you so much for your for for your presentation. And so now we'll be our last speaker, Elizabeth De Stevens, with a Black Knight Energy. Thanks, Mark. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, wonderful. Well, thanks for um, having me. This is my first um, meeting with Fang, and, and it's been great so far. Uh, I'm Elizabeth De Stephens with Black Knight Energy. Black Knight is a Kane Anderson backed portfolio company. It's private equity for those of you who don't know Kane. We were backed in mid 2021. Um, and uh, I won't read through this whole slide, but the, the nutshell for you guys and the focus of what I'm going to talk about today is um, we have been very active uh, in the trenches in the AD market, um, largely US onshore um, upstream assets, but we've also looked at oil field services and renewables, um, deal size. 300, 400 million dollars up to 4 billion. Uh, we have participated in a lot of things, looked at a lot of things, and I'm going to um, share some insights on what's been happening in the A&D market over the last couple of years and what I think um, is, is likely to happen in 2023. These views are my own, uh, not the views of necessarily my, uh, my company or my portfolio, uh, my, my portfolio sponsor. Next slide. Okay, so um, A and D market um, in 2022 felt sort of like this, uh, but a whole lot less fun. Um, There's a whole lot of, um, uh, of starts and stops and failed transactions, um, things that uh, people thought were going to get done and, and spent a lot of time and, and didn't get done. And um, a, not everybody in the space felt like this, but um, most companies that were participating in A&D um, in 2022 would share, um, would share this, this impression. So it was a slog through the mud. It was very difficult. Um, and it was a, um, a, a period in the cycle that we actually haven't really seen, um, at least for, for a long time. So let's talk about why that is. Um, so Invera shared something similar to this. Um, but basically what I've done is broken this down into for 2022, um, who was buying, and then um, up in the lower area, uh, what was the percentage of private sellers for those transactions by quarter. And so from a trends perspective, uh, what you can see is the first couple of quarters are dominated by large caps, um, and then your, um, or, sorry, do dominated by small mid caps, majors, and then your, your large caps start coming in. And they were coming in um, initially with some equity uh, as part of consideration, and that then evolved to um, paying full cash price for, for transactions. Um, the big gray bar that was a private seller, that one um, was almost entirely ICAP era, which is yet to close, but uh, should close soon. Um, and there's an enormous amount of pent up A&D demand um, in the upstream space specifically. Historically, from 2010 to 2018, we averaged about $50 billion uh, a year of, of A&D deals. Um, and that was fairly consistent throughout that period of time. 19 and 20 were a lot lower. 2021, it rebounded. And then in 2022, it came way back down. Um, my personal estimation is there are about $20 billion of failed deals um, or pause deals on the sidelines um, in 2022. And that's a big number. That's a lot of transactions. So what's going on? Um, a couple of you have already talked about uh, price changes. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the natural gas and the WTI oil strip prices at periods of time. And so the blue line is 12 um, December 2021, uh, orange line is June 2022, um, October 2022, and then this is February 2020. Sorry, that's 2023, not 2022. Um, so basically what was happening in a lot of transactions is, you know, in the course of a two month process, price starts at one point and ends up at another point. And one, the first thing that that does is it really uh, makes it hard for the buyer and the seller to agree upon a price. Even if they are able to agree upon a price, it then makes it very, very, very difficult for the buyer to lock in appropriate financing um, at that 
higher price that they agreed upon with the seller. And so, um, and this didn't happen to us, but it happened to others. Um, a lot of buyers would bid a high price to get the deal. And then they just were not able to get financing for that deal because the banks are not gonna loan at a high price. Um, debt was getting more expensive, the equity wasn't there. And so there's enormous amount of um, failed transactions because of the volatility, even if the buyer and the seller could agree on the price. But what the volatility does is it just makes it so difficult to agree on a, on a price. Um, the other thing that's been happening is um, there's an enormous amount of deleveraging and restructuring that occurred from 2016 to 2020. Companies went bankrupt. If they didn't go bankrupt, they paid down a lot of debt or they were trying to pay down debt. They were having capital discipline. And then that brought us into a period of high prices in 2022 plus your capital discipline and a total shareholder return focus. What that has resulted in is really strong balance sheets and a whole lot of cash. Um, public companies and private companies um, are sitting on a lot of cash, uh, not everybody, but, uh, but most of your public companies are really, really in good shape right now. And so you would think, okay, well, that'll mean that they're gonna go out and, and buy things, but to buy things, you have to have people selling things. And there's not really a catalyst um, for companies that don't have any distress um, to go out and sell things. And in fact, um, somebody I know who was selling a large packet in the market, not to me, um, told me privately, I don't need more cash right now, right? What did this public seller really need? They needed inventory. Um, they didn't really need to sell the non-core package that they had on the market. And so unless they got a huge price for it, which we've already talked about, isn't really financeable, um, they weren't going to sell it, right? So it's something they don't really want. It's something they don't really need in the, the package, but they were going to keep it. Um, so another thing that's been happening, and this is from RBC Richardson Barr, is the um, investors are continuing to demand return of capital. And so instead of outspending cash flow, Again, we've got return of capital and we've got a whole lot of cash sitting on the sidelines that um, the companies are gonna have to do something with. Um, one of the other barriers in 2022, which has kind of resolved itself to a certain degree now, there were large hedge losses. So um, those of you who aren't familiar with bank loans, um, there's oftentimes a very high percentage of your volumes that you have to hedge. And so everybody that had credit amendments or came out of restructuring in 2020 had to hedge a sizable portion of their production at low prices. And so what that means is um, they're going to incur losses, uh, hedge loss if they sell. And so it makes their hold case look a whole lot better than it would have otherwise. And that was really collapsing a lot of transactions and making um, sellers that would normally sell go, well, I might as well keep it. I'm making cash flow. I'm fine. Um, I don't want to incur this hedge loss because my whole case, case looks better. Those hedges have been rolling off. And so um, he they're hedged at a little bit of a higher price. Price volatility has come down. And so this is not as big of a barrier in 2023. And so I'm going to close out with my personal predictions for 2023. I think price volatility is going to chill out. Like we I talked about, hedging losses are rolling off for a lot of players. Mm. So they're not going to be a major barrier to transactability, mm. but those are going to be offset by debt getting more expensive. So I'm not going to have to deal with hedges, but I have to deal with debt getting more expensive, which, which is a little bit of a barrier to transactability. I think bid ask spread is going to be narrowed, but it will still remain an issue. And then we are seeing the emergence of new capital in the upstream space from non-traditional sources. So an example of that would be Ineos coming in and buying um, Chesapeake's South Texas oil assets. Um, so a and activity here are my predictions. I think the publics are gonna continue to buy inventory from small mid caps and opportunistic private sellers. I think majors are gonna to continue to divert capital to LNG renewables and ESG initiatives, uh, but they're also gonna still buy um, traditional assets where, where they see an opportunity. Uh, I do think the publics are gonna start selling large non-core positions for strategic reasons. We're already seeing that happened with Chesapeake. And I think that they're going to be more of them, uh, but keep in mind, they don't really have to sell. So there has to be a strategic reason for them to do it. We talked about the atypical buyers coming in and I ultimately think there are gonna be a lot of mergers and consolidation. So those are my predictions. Here's my contact info, I'll put it in the chat. Thanks for letting me go last and I'm happy to connect with anybody. 
Perfect, excellent. Um, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Elizabeth. We have about five minutes left. Um, I'd like each panelist to, um, for you know, maybe 10 to 15 seconds, just do a, a, a quick summary. Unfortunately, um, I don't think we're going to have uh, time for questions. But guess what? You you know, you've got everyone's contact information, so you can you know um, uh, connect with them and, and ask them. Uh, questions offline. So if we can, you know, go in uh, the order that we we, uh, we spoke in, um, and if we can have our, our first uh, panelist, Justin, for your summary. Thank you. Sure. Thanks again, Mark, for having me. It was great uh, to listen to everybody else and to participate. I would just say that um, you know, the markets are resilient. Um, there's going to be um, ways that capital gets deployed. There's certainly going to be demand, as you heard, efficiency, um, you know, is being wrung out of existing um, assets and, you know, the old assets are being repurposed as part of the transition. So I think, you know, there's going to be robust deal activity either way. It's just kind of a question of what form and, you know, how the regulatory landscape and geopolitics shapes those deals. Thanks again for, for the time, everybody. You're welcome. Thank you. Alex Rosenfeld. Yes. Um, I'd say a uh, takeaway is if you like volatility, if you believe in volatility, or if you don't like volatility and you think there's going to be less, um, there are interesting investments on the uh, venture side in the energy transition some of which are going to do really great because they deal with lowering volatility through stability and others are going to do well in other markets. Uh, sometimes you can find kind of ones that do well in all markets. Uh, so I think it's, it's an interesting asset class that has a lot of uh, wind behind it. And uh, I think a, a lot of the information you've seen around where oil prices and traditional energy is going just kind of complements the case to have a uh, balanced uh, uh, portfolio and I and for, for me balance is balance within the new energy side and, and less on, on the oil and gas side. Thank you. Sean, Kimmy Agar. Yes, sir. Um I I'll my, my first thing, appreciate the invite. Appreciate being um, with all of you today, 50 plus uh, wonderful people. Um, what I would say is uh, as was mentioned and I, I love Elizabeth's wrap up as well. Um, Free cash flow seems to be seems to be king. There's a lot of money going around, but um, I, I think a lot of the money uh, is going to be spent on uh, improving development strategies, going after um, proving inventory, and uh, not necessarily um, going after, as uh, Elizabeth also mentioned, um, assets that are unproven for the time being. But uh, efficiency is going to be the name of the game, and uh, spending that free cash flow on that. Anna Mixulka. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, just to kind of add from the geopolitical perspective, uh, energy security is, has been now strongly in, in the uh, energy transition uh, trajectory the way it hasn't been uh, before. And I think it kind of changed the traje trajectory, which will support um, domestic energy resources, including oil and gas in the US, coal for other countries, and renewables for others, which do not have these resources. So I think it's going to be more all of the above picture going forward as countries have to deal not only with a transition to cleaner sources, but making sure that their populations have access to energy. Thanks. John Sosa. Yeah, hey, thanks uh, for the opportunity today, Mark. Uh, it was great meeting you all. Um, I would just say this, uh, demand's gonna remain very dynamic and likely to continue to exceed expectations, uh, particularly led by Asia and China. That'll be bumping up against an inflexible supply picture where there's the OPEC cuts, um, sanctions uh, around Russia, and or the sputtering recovery we're seeing in the shale patch in the US. Um, likewise, uh, as mentioned on this call, we're not out of the woods yet in terms of the winter of 23-24. So we could have the same sort of pressure on gas, LNG, coal, BTUs, and the potential for massive fuel switching that we didn't have this year, but could be very much with us next year, depending on the weather. So the back half of this year is going to be very tight, and it's going to be incredibly tight if the weather uh, delivers a uh, punch. So this year is going to look very different than what people expected. And this year is going to look very different in the back half of the year than the front half of the year. Excellent. And Pedro Blanco. 
and yeah thank you mark again for the invitation uh, especially today that i'm not wearing my private equity hat just my capturian hat uh well and um, for sure i just want to highlight that um that this is just a, a new market and a new tool you know carbon credits and environmental assets it's just a new big market that is going out there to help you know the transition and to help companies just manage their uh you know their finances in a different way than just you know uh, production and, and cost reduction this is just another financial tool that will help companies on the energy transitions and to comply with the regulations that are coming thank you again for the invitation nice to meet you all and perfect elizabeth if you want to go again uh, great if not i mean the go. only thing the only thing I would add, you know, deals are going to get done. They're not necessarily going to be any easier than they have. And um, I, I do think the one thing I did not go into is when we're talking about these huge mergers that are going to happen, uh, I do expect more um, government oversight. The FCC is going to come in and throw in red flags on some of these deals um, that will prevent some of them for, from uh, going through as originally intended. So that's the other emerging trend that's happening. Excellent. Perfect. My name is Mark Hamza Arabogbo, Chairman of Energy and Natural Resources with the FENG, the Financial Executives Networking Group. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Take care.